on World News Tonight. Blazing Inferno. Hong Kong sees victims engulfed in a major fire with rescue operations underway. COVID catastrophe. The world sees another wave of deadly infections as WHO warns against Omicron. Power pill. Pfizer's jab may be overtaken by a brand new pill fighting against the new COVID strain. Noel Night. France sees Christmas markets filled with light and joy as shoppers celebrate the season. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Ada Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Suzanne Shainali. Very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage with updates on the devastating fire that engulfed Hong Kong's World Trade Center. Firefighters and rescuers got to work after a fire broke out in Hong Kong, trapping more than 100 people in the building. About 150 people were trapped on the roof of a building located in the bustling commercial and shopping district of Causeway Bay. Firefighters stood on aerial lifts during the rescue operation after having battled the blaze with two water jets. Emergency services personnel and ambulances were also deployed to the scene, with one person seen being transported away while holding into a breathing apparatus. About 100 people moved from a restaurant to the 39th floor when the fire broke out and smoke filled the dining area. Another 1,200 people were evacuated after smoke filled the busy shopping and office complex. Now on to the update of the COVID pandemic. The Omicron variant has been detected in over 70 countries since it was first identified three weeks ago, fueling concerns that its largest number of mutations will help it spread faster and evade protection provided by COVID-19 vaccines or prior infection. Just three weeks after it was first detected, the Omicron variant of COVID-19 has spread to at least 77 countries. But World Health Organization officials say it's likely already in most countries, spreading fast and shouldn't be underestimated. Omicron is spreading at a rate we have not seen with any previous variant. Surely we have learned by now that we underestimate this virus at our peril. While there is much uncertainty surrounding the newest variant, health experts believe it will soon become the dominant strain of the virus. Even if Omicron does cause less severe disease, the sheer number of cases could once again overwhelm unprepared health systems. I need to be very clear, vaccines alone will not get any country out of this crisis. The U.S. CDC on Tuesday said the fast-spreading variant was responsible for 13 percent of COVID-19 cases in New Jersey, New York, Puerto Rico and Virgin Islands at the end of last week. And the variant is suspected in a wave of COVID cases at Cornell University in upstate New York that led university officials to close much of the campus Tuesday. Cornell reported more than 700 new cases in just three days and said in a statement that evidence of the Omicron variant was identified in, quote, a significant number of Monday's positive student samples. The university reports 97 percent of its campus population is vaccinated. According to a joint study released Tuesday by researchers at Harvard, MIT and Massachusetts General Hospital, all three U.S. authorized COVID-19 vaccines appear to be significantly less protective against the Omicron variant. But a booster dose likely restores much of that protection. A new study shows that Pfizer-BioNTech's COVID-19 vaccine has been less effective in South Africa at keeping people infected with the virus out of hospital since the Omicron variant emerged last month. Two doses of Pfizer-BioNTech's COVID-19 vaccine appear to have given 70% protection against hospitalization in South Africa in recent weeks and 33% protection against infection. That's according to a major real-world study that suggests weaker efficacy against the new Omicron variant. However, the findings are not conclusive. The study, released on Tuesday by Discovery Health, was based on more than 211,000 positive COVID-19 test results from November 15th to December 7th. Around 78,000 of those results were attributed to Omicron and not confirmed as such, meaning the study cannot offer definitive findings about the variant. 
Shirley Colley, Chief Health Analytics Actuary at Discovery Health, explains. In the prior period, the vaccine effectiveness amongst our client base um, in the period September to October was sitting at 93%. In other words, our, um, our fully vaccinated Pfizer clients were 93% less likely to be admitted to hospital for COVID-19 um, when, when Delta was circulating. However, now in the Omicron period, that, that has reduced to 70%. Discovery Health cautioned that the findings should be considered preliminary. Ryan Noach, the CEO, said they were, however, encouraging. What is clear is that vaccinated individuals are experiencing milder infections in general, and that's supported by the data shown by the 70% effectiveness against severe illness, and also supported by anecdote where we're hearing that it's primarily the unvaccinated that are requiring admission and also that are requiring oxygen in hospital. South African scientists say it accounts for 78% of sequences from November, more than the previously dominant Delta variant. The WHO said it is unclear whether Omicron is inherently more contagious than Delta. Children appear to have a 20% higher risk of hospital admission with complications during the fourth wave than during the first, despite a very low absolute incidence. South African scientists have said they cannot confirm that link, which could be due to other factors. Despite the concerning drop in efficacy of the jab, Pfizer said final analysis of its COVID-19 pill still showed nearly 90% efficacy in preventing hospitalization and deaths in high-risk patients. And recent lab data suggested the drug retains its effectiveness against the Omicron variant of the coronavirus. As hospitals buckle under the strain of COVID, Pfizer's antiviral pill, if approved, could protect against Delta and Omicron reducing the risk of hospitalization or death by 89% when taken within three days of the onset of symptoms. But it won't come soon enough for the soaring number of medical centers facing record admissions. At UMass Memorial, they ran out of ICU beds a week ago. I'm shocked that Massachusetts is in this situation. We are the most vaccinated state in the country, and yet here we are in a surge of COVID that's just as bad as where we were last year at this point. As Delta devastates lives, the more contagious mutation of Omicron on its way to becoming more dominant in the U.S. has now been found in at least 33 states. The CDC says genomic surveillance shows the variant detected at a rate of 3% nationally, but at 13% in parts of the Northeast. What we're seeing in some of these other countries is doubling times of about every two days or so. So really rapid increase in the amount of Omicron that's out there. A year ago today, the first shots went into arms in what many hoped would be the beginning of the end of the pandemic. I need to be very clear. Vaccines alone will not get any country out of this crisis. It's not vaccines instead of masks. It's not vaccines instead of distancing. Do it all. Do it consistently. Now companies like Kroger are ending some benefits for the unvaccinated. The NFL requiring boosters for staffers after a spike in positive cases. NYU becoming the first major university to require boosters for students and staff. And at Cornell, where Omicron has been detected, school officials are shutting down campus. Tonight, an evolving pandemic with a revolving cost. Almost 100 conservative lawmakers voted against new coronavirus restrictions, dealing a major blow to British Prime Minister Boris Johnson's authority and raising questions about his leadership. So the eyes have it, the eyes have it. It's the biggest rebellion of his premiership since he became the PM. Almost 100 conservative lawmakers voted on Tuesday against new coronavirus restrictions, dealing a blow to British Prime Minister Boris Johnson's leadership over measures he deemed necessary to curb the spread of the new Omicron variant. The measures were eventually passed due to support from the opposition Labour Party, after the PM put out a plea to support his government's Plan B measures. The health, safety and security of our nation and its people 
must always be the first priority. That's why we will always support measures designed to protect public health. That includes the measures in Plan B. MPs voted to back compulsory face masks and vaccinations for health workers, scrapping isolation for fully jabbed contact cases and NHS COVID passes showing full vaccination or recent negative tests will be needed for entry into several venues from Wednesday. Many of Johnson's own party attacked his measures, especially the COVID pass, as draconian, despite the PM arguing the curbs were needed to protect the people. Johnson is already under fire for several scandals, including an expensive refurbishment of his Downing Street residence and alleged government Christmas parties last year when the rest of the country was in a strict lockdown. On Tuesday, the UK reported almost 60,000 new coronavirus cases, the highest figure since early January. More than 5,000 cases of Omicron have since been recorded, and one person has died since contracting the variant. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken, who's in Indonesia on the first leg of the week-long tour to Southeast Asia, is laying out the Biden administration's plan for the Indo-Pacific region. He stressed the U.S. will expand military and economic partnerships to counter China's growing aggression in that part of the world. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is pinpointing alliance, military and economy as the key areas the U.S. will focus on to push back against China's increasing assertiveness in the Indo-Pacific region. He was giving a speech during a trip to Indonesia Tuesday, underscoring that Washington will further expand its military and economic partnerships in Asia. Second, we will forge stronger connections within and beyond the region. We'll deepen our treaty alliances with Japan, the Republic of Korea, Australia, the Philippines, and Thailand. Those bonds have long provided the foundation for peace, security, and prosperity in the region. We'll foster greater cooperation among these allies as well. Such remarks come as the Biden administration is focused on countering Beijing's growing aggressiveness in the region, especially in the South China Sea, Hong Kong, and against Taiwan. Blinken also reaffirmed Biden's determination to maintain peace and prosperity in the region. He added that's why the U.S. seeks serious and sustained diplomacy with North Korea with the ultimate goal of denuclearizing the Korean Peninsula. On bolstering security, Blinken stressed the U.S. will continue to carry out what the Pentagon chief previously described as, quote, integrated deterrence. And will adopt a strategy that more closely weaves together all our instruments of national power, diplomacy, military, intelligence, with those of our allies and our partners. Our Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin, calls this integrated deterrence. And it's about reinforcing our strengths so that we can keep the peace, as we've done in the region for decades. Lincoln stressed that the U.S. is not trying to force countries in the region to choose between Washington and Beijing, nor is it seeking conflict with China, saying such a move would be catastrophic for the world. Russian President Vladimir Putin and Chinese President Xi Jinping have come together to discuss tensions in Europe and aggressive U.S. and NATO rhetoric during a video call. For further details, let's cross over to other there in a world news special correspondent Nimoda Hatarusinga, who joins us now from Kursk in Russia for more. Nimoda? Yes, Shinali. The conversation is taking place at the moment of high tension in both countries, relations with the West, the Beijing under pressure over human rights and Moscow over its build-up of troops near the border with Ukraine. Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peskov said, referring to Moscow and Beijing, that the situation in international affairs, especially on the European continent, is very tense and requires discussion between allies. Russia has cultivated closer ties with China as its relations with the West have worsened. And Putin has used the partnership as a way of balancing U.S. influence while striking lucrative deals, especially on energy. He and Xi this year agreed to extend a 20-year friendship and cooperation treaty. Peskov said they would hold a long conversation with a broad agenda including energy, trade and investment. Their discussion took place eight days after a Russia-U.S. video call in which U.S. President Joe Biden warned Putin against invading Ukraine and Putin told him Russia needed legally binding security guarantees from the West. 
Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. And that was at the Daruna World News Special Correspondent Nimoda Hathra Singer reporting from Kursk in Russia. At least 30 people are now feared dead after a fuel truck exploded near a street in Haiti's second largest city. Due to the size of the explosion, the total number of injured has also yet to be confirmed. Sirens wailing into the night as cars and homes are engulfed in flames. Dozens have been killed when a fuel tanker exploded in Haiti's second largest city late Monday, with local media saying the toll is feared to rise. Local hospitals say they are overwhelmed and that due to charring, it's been difficult to identify the victims. Naturally, a lot of human lives were lost, but up to this point we can't give a number because there have been deaths within houses we haven't identified yet. The explosion also damaged the fronts of houses, shops and scorched motorbikes and cars. Haiti's prime minister said Tuesday that field hospitals will be deployed to the area to help those affected and declared three days of national mourning. The blast is the latest tragedy to hit the nation as Haiti struggles with crippling fuel shortages and spiralling petrol prices. The country was also plunged into political crisis in July after the presidential assassination of Jovenel Moise as criminal gang-related kidnappings surge. And a 7.2 magnitude earthquake in August killed over 2,000 people and destroyed over 10,000 homes. An Arctic temperature record of more than 100 Fahrenheit was reached in a Siberian town last year during a prolonged heat wave that caused widespread alarm about the intensity of global warming. The UN has confirmed a new record temperature was set in the Arctic last year during an exceptionally prolonged Siberian heat wave. At a press conference in Geneva, Claire Nullis, a spokeswoman for the UN's World Meteorological Organization, made the announcement. The World Meteorological Organization has uh, this morning recognized a temperature of 38 degrees Celsius, um, which uh, in Fahrenheit is a staggering 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit in the Russian town uh, of Verkhoyansk. Verkhoyansk is 115 kilometers north of the Arctic Circle, but is in a region warming at more than double the global average. The extreme heat fanned wildfires across northern Russia's forests and tundra, even igniting normally waterlogged peatlands and releasing record carbon emissions. As a result, the UN agency says, we saw massive sea, Arctic sea ice loss at the end of the summer season. And this heat wave um, did play a major role in 2020, being the one of the warmest three years on record. The heat that we saw in Siberia in 2020 would have been almost impossible without climate change. The UN agency is also investigating whether a reading of 54.4 degrees centigrade in Death Valley, California in both 2020 and 2021 would be the all-time world heat record. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Toyota committed $70 billion to electrify its automobiles by 2030, half of it to develop a battery electric vehicle lineup. Eleven bodies have been found while 25 people remain missing after a boat carrying suspected undocumented migrants from Indonesia capsized off Malaysia. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz vowed to win the fight against the coronavirus pandemic, imploring Germans in his first major address to the parliament to get vaccinated as the only way out of the crisis. Dutch Prime Minister Mark Rutte said the Netherlands will extend COVID-19 restrictions through the Christmas holidays, including the early closures of school. India is facing a new wave of COVID-19 infections with the rapid spread of Omicron variant. Official data shows that India has registered 57 cases of the Omicron variant across the country since the first case appeared in the country.
And finally tonight, lights swirled around trees and festive decorations adorn stalls at the traditional Christmas market of the eastern French town of Colmar. Despite a lower turnout of visitors in one of the country's most renowned Christmas markets as France faces its fifth COVID-19 wave. The holiday site opened for the first time since 2019 after Christmas markets were banned from the opening last year amid a nationwide lockdown. Vendors celebrated the market's return, although many have so far observed a 10 to 30 percent drop in revenues compared to 2019. This year, visitors are required to wear face masks in the market's vicinity, and those who want a taste of warm mulled wine and pretzels are subject to mandatory health pass checks. Christmas market vendors' businesses were adapting based on developments with the Omicron variant. But for most, the pandemic will not stop celebrations. Many said with COVID-19, Christmas will continue to remain the same. In case you have missed any of the stories we aired tonight, you can re-watch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow with another edition of World News. I'm Suzanne Shanali. Until then, stay safe and have a good night.